Hello, American Prestige listeners. It's Derek, uh, and I am grateful to be joined on exceedingly short notice, and thanks uh, to her for doing it, by Mariam Jamshidi, a returning champion, associate professor of law at the University of Colorado. Mariam, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I know this has been literally a matter of hours since we asked you, so thanks for doing no it on such short notice. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, we're, I mean, we're happy to have you back. I guess it would be nice if it was under better circumstances. Um, but I do want to talk to you about the legal ramifications or implications of what's happening in Gaza under international law. And I think we should start with the ge most general question here. What is Gaza's status under international law? A lot of people uh, you see argue that this is essentially a state on state conflict and that Israel doesn't have any obligations uh, because Gaza, you know, they pulled out of Gaza in whatever, 2005, 2006 right. uh, and washed their hands of it. Is that really Gaza's status under international law? No, Gaza a leading question. I know the answer. But. <laughs> Gaza's status on under international law is, is very clear. As of 1967, um, Gaza is considered to be occupied territory, occupied by Israel. You alluded to the reason why uh, Israel now tries tries to argue that it is no longer occupied because it removed its settlers from uh, Gaza. But uh, having settlers present in a territory isn't necessary or required in order for it to be occupied. Um, certainly, Israel controls effectively everything that comes into and out of Gaza, its land border, its sea border its air, it controls electricity going in and out. I mean, you name it. And uh, separate and apart from all of those facts on the ground, you do still have the legal recognition under international law that Gaza is occupied. So what are the implications of that? What is that? What, is, what kind of onus does that put on Israel in, you know, and, you know, we can sort of ease into the current conflict, but uh, just, in general, what does that mean in terms of Israel's obligations to the this territory and its people? Yeah, that's a great question. So as an occupying power, Israel has a sort of, uh, it's a combination of different legal regimes that govern Israel's obligations um, and rights with respect to Gaza. So the law of occupation combines uh, the laws of war with uh, human rights law. What I think is the most important thing to recognize is that states do not have the right of self-defense against populations or entities within territories that they occupy. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that Israel doesn't have the right to defend itself from attacks coming from within that territory. Instead, what it means is that its response in defending itself is different. It's more limited because this is occupied territory. It has a police power, and that police power allows the the Israeli armed forces to engage in limited activity, violent activity with respect to, or taking in, into consideration the importance of preserving civilian life and safety. So they can engage in the use of violence to defend themselves, but it must be limited to, and uh, take into consideration the threats to civilian life and civilian safety. Now, they can use lethal force, but again, even in that context, but again, they have to take into consideration the overall circumstances. It must be a matter of last resort to engage in lethal force. And even if they decide to engage in military action, they are more limited in the context of the police power over an occupied territory than they are with respect to the right of self-defense in armed conflict. So. Israel cannot invoke military necessity to try and justify its actions with respect to armed attacks inside of Gaza because Gaza is occupied. If Gaza was not considered occupied territory, then we would be in a different situation where 
I mean, opinions differ. Arguably, Israel would have a right to self-defense under international law. And that really does op- uh, open up a much broader range of actions and much, much more catastrophic violence that Israel can engage in. But still, there are still limits to what a state can do, even in the course of exercising its right of self-defense. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk about what the laws of war say specifically, and you know, we're going to get into the Jabalia refugee camp strike in a moment. But but in a, in a general sense, what do the laws of war say about an ob- a state's obligation to uh, protect civilian life or minimize civilian casualties in a situation where uh, as is the case in Gaza, and you know, you hear the human shield defense brought up a lot, but uh, you know, just the geography of it means that uh, these military sites that Hamas and other militants use are right on top of, or underneath, in some cases, uh, civilian areas. What is the what are the rules, the quote unquote rules of war, uh, say about how you can uh, approach that? Well, I mean, let's start with sort of the easy. Um, Principle. So the easy principle is that in conducting armed conflict and engaging in, um, in in violence in the context of an armed conflict, belligerents, so those that are doing the fighting, cannot directly and intentionally or recklessly target civilians or civilian objects. You can't do that. Now, where it gets, you know, more complicated, quote unquote is where you have what are called dual use, particularly with respect to infrastructure, dual use items. So where you have a residential building, potentially a hospital that is not only serving a civilian purpose, but is also serving some sort of military purpose. Now, the first thing is that the attacker, the person who wants to attack this object, needs to ensure that it is in fact being used for some sort of military purpose. Okay. So that there is in fact, there are in fact fighters there or a command base there or whatever. But even then, even if it's able to establish that, it still can only take action that is proportional. So the relative military advantage needs to be proportional to the harm. I in other words, the civilian death that will result from that military advantage. Now, this is not a fabulous principle when it comes to protecting civilians because, or civilian objects, because obviously it allows belligerents to attack those things effectively on a range of grounds, as long as they are considered legitimate military grounds. And what does legitimate mean as incredibly broadly defined, if it even has a definition at all? So the the only thing that potentially provides some protection, right, is this notion of proportionality. This notion that you have to sort of weigh the costs and benefits effectively of what you're doing. It isn't a straight numerical comparison. So it's not necessarily disproportionate to attack a civilian object where you can kill, let's say, the commander of some important military force simply because 10 civilians will be killed that isn't necessarily going to violate the principle of proportionality. You know, what does it depend on? Again, it probably depends on the importance of this individual, you know, potentially precautions that you took to try and minimize damages to civilians. The point being, it's not a straight numerical comparison. So when you're thinking about what happened to the Jabalia refugee camp, what do these principles tell us? Well, Certainly, this notion that there was some military commander there does provide some military objective um, that for the Israelis to rely on. But at the same time, I, I can't remember what the death count was the last time. And we're not talking about death, we're talking about injury as well, as well as 
Right. So the last I saw, um, and there have been multiple attacks now on the camp over the last two days, but the last I saw was yes, right. uh, 133 dead and over 300 wounded. So if that helps contextualize. Right. So we're talking about proportionality, both in terms of civilian death and injury, as well as the destruction of civilian infrastructure, you know. So if we're looking at this entire picture, so just taking the first attack that happened whenever it was yesterday, I think, the notion that the that that killing this commander was proportionate, the value of that military objective was proportionate to killing over a hundred people, injuring hundreds of people, destroying that entire neighborhood. I mean, putting on my common sense, average person hat, that's a hard pill for me to swallow. I have a hard time looking at that and saying, well, there's any military that that military objective could somehow justify what happened and what they did, knowing full well. I mean, they were very well aware of the number of individuals there, right? So there's awareness that's also very important here. You know, if they aren't aware, then that's a a very different kind of analysis. But they knew full well what they were attacking, the fact that this was a residential area, the fact that it was full of civilian objects, full of civilians. They did it for the sake of killing one person. I said before, it's not a straight numerical comparison, but I think this goes beyond numbers in terms of reaching the conclusion that, you know, this was this was a war crime. Uh, It's I mean, I I guess it's impossible on some level to imagine creating a more objective standard for what is and is not allowable. Uh, And of course, bearing in mind that all of this is absent any enforcement mechanism. So what difference does it make at the end of the day, practically? Uh, but do you think these rules are are vague on purpose? Like, the, do the people who make the rules of the rules based order want to keep this as vague as possible to avoid any potential uh, application of them? I mean, I can't read anyone's mind half the time. I don't know what I think, but I would say that. I do agree with you that these are rules that are intentionally vague and quite broad in terms of their application. And that vagueness and this and that breadth allows both the individuals and states and organizations involved in armed activity as well as their supporters to manufacture this notion of plausible deniability that, you know, you can't really tell. It's too hard. We have to look at the facts really closely. We're not in the room making these wartime decisions. You know, they make it turn on in some ways so much law, but that, but law that is vague, that it can become very difficult to reach a consensus about whether an action was in fact prohibited outside of circumstances that are just incredibly, incredibly, incredibly egregious. And even in those situations, you still, like for example, the refugee camp situation, you still hear the refrain of human shields, dual use, you know, we did our best. We try to minimize civilian. There is an obligation to minimize, right, that goes along with this proportionality analysis. So. This is what happens in war. This was the John Kirby line from the other day. This is what happens in war. I mean, I would say this. It's it's unfortunate. I would say the John Kirby line goes, takes us back 75 years, you know, to World War II, to World War I, where the laws in terms of uh, the the laws governing the actual conduct of war were more permissive than they have been since the end of World War II. It is no longer, even under this broad, permissive framework for the conduct of war, it is no longer an excuse to say, well, this is war. No, there are rules. They're not perfect, 
They certainly are not enforced against everyone equally or at all. But if if you're going to talk about the rules all the time, like the United States does, then, you know. If you're going to talk about the rules with respect to Russia, right? If you're going to talk about the rules with respect to China, you do yourself a disservice in actively undermining them anytime you think your national interest is in that moment served by the erosion of those rules. And that's just the cynical political argument against doing this. I'm a law professor. I'm a lawyer. You know, as as troubling and, and incomplete and sometimes violent the law itself actually is, I would rather work with the law than work in a situation, in a context, in a world where there is no law. Where it, it, it is truly is just might makes right. And nothing else. So, Miriam, I know I want to be cognizant of your time. I do have one more question, and that is about uh, obligations that Israel might have in terms of humanitarian relief, Mm -hmm. uh, the siege that they imposed after the October 7th attacks. Right. Smacks to me of of collective punishment. Um, I don't know, you know, how how that would be interpreted uh, under a legal, strict legal definition, but it, it seems like collective punishment. And I'm curious... Uh, you know, they, they've sort of started ratcheting up aid. It's still, you know, be- below the line even that the U.N. has set for like the bare minimum that it needs to get in. So as, as you've watched that piece of this play out, what is your your reaction in terms of uh, Israeli obligations and whether they're meeting? So there are a couple of questions there. So I think one sounds like the issue of the siege and whether or not that's lawful. And the other one sounds like it's a question about um, Israel's obligation to allow humanitarian aid um, into Gaza. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. Okay, so let's start with the siege. So, you know, again, the laws of war are created by states. They are created with a mind towards, you know, uh, allowing for flexibility. Um, They are permissive, but not totally unrestrained siege is allowed as a tool of war. You can engage in a siege. Now it's a siege against your enemies, against the, your, your belligerents on the other side, right? Against in this case, Hamas, a siege that totally impacts the civilian population as well raises questions about distinction, about proportionality that I mentioned before. So as a way of conducting war, siege is also restrained by the laws that govern the conduct of war. So you need to think about proportionality. You need to think about distinction. You need to think about minimizing harm to civilians. So does a total, I mean, and there was already a siege on Gaza before this happened, um, that was impacting health, uh, everything, um, life, you name it. But now it's nothing is getting in right. Or almost nothing. So I think that a siege of this nature, which also involves cutting off electricity, you know, cutting off fuel, like cutting off truly effectively depriving the Gaza Strip of water, you know, I, this kind of siege looks far more like indiscriminate collective punishment, which is a war crime, than a proportionate tool of armed conflict against Hamas. And one thing I might mention here is that part of Israel's logic in making the arguments it makes about its adherence to the laws of war, because it claims to adhere to those laws, is that it effectively, and I think this is really clear, especially this time around, it defines Hamas as effectively all Palestinians. So a siege against Hamas is a siege against all of Gaza. It is proportionate and discriminate in that way, under Israeli logic. 
Now, the obligations about um, humanitarian aid. So this goes back to Gaza's status as an occupied territory. As an occupier, as long as the, the, the individuals, the organizations providing the aid are considered to be neutral and they don't discriminate sort of against either side, they have to be allowed in. So if this wasn't a situation of occupation, Israel could withdraw its cons- could 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 ag- could, could um, refuse. So it does turn on consent in most situations outside of occupation. Now it can't arbitrarily deprive its consent even in those situations, but its consent does matter because this territory is occupied. Though Israel can't say no. Humanitarian aid does need to be allowed in. And the refusal, and this sort of gets back to the other pro- another problem with the siege, the refusal to allow humanitarian aid in effectively in this situation amounts to starving the population. I think as of today, Gaza has run out of flour. You know, and starvation as a tool of war is completely and utterly prohibited. There's no situation in which you can't starve a population. You just can't do that. So I think uh, we will leave it there. Uh, That's a cheery uh, (laughs) note to end on, as always, uh, on this show. We're good at that. Miriam Jamshidi, I want to thank you again uh, uh, for coming on the program. And uh, as this continues to unfold, I know know, we could get into some of the endgame scenarios that are starting to be bandied about and the legality of those, but uh, why don't we leave it here for now, and, and uh, we will, uh, I'm sure, be be back in touch with you as this continues. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, I think that might be the case. Um, and uh, it was, uh, although a very depressing conversation, a, pl- a pleasure to speak with you, Darren. Well, thanks for doing it. Uh, we love having you on. Thanks. Thanks.